Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Lindberg. I'm the branch manager at the Scottsville Library. And on behalf of the Jefferson Madison Regional Library, welcome to the virtual program, Neglected History, Lives of Enslaved Laborers on the Monticello, Montpelier, and Highland, Highland Plantations. Thank you so much for joining us in honor of Juneteenth. JMRL is hosting a related program on Tuesday, June 22nd at 7 p.m. entitled Forgotten History of Penn Park, Unmarked Graves of Enslaved Persons. To learn more and to find programming for all ages, please visit jmrl.org or call your local branch. Tonight's program, as all JMRL programs are, made possible by the generous support of Friends of the Library. A few technical pointers. This evening's program will be recorded for inclusion on the JMRL YouTube channel. So barring any technical difficulties, we hope to have it posted within the next few days. Attendees' mics have been muted, but there will be time for questions and answers at the end of the program. Please enter any questions you might have into the chat box at the bottom of your screen and we will address as many as possible, time permitting. Thank you. And now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's presenters. Gail Jessup White is Public Relations and Community Engagement Officer at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, and she is a descendant of the Hemings and Jefferson families. She is the author of a book to be released by HarperCollins this fall entitled excuse me, Reclamation, Sally Hemings, Thomas Jefferson, and a Descendant Search for Her Family's Lasting Legacy. Welcome, Gail. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here this evening. Hillary M. Hicks is a senior research historian at James Madison's Montpelier. Among her many research projects, she has done extensive work and research on the naming project, which seeks to uncover information about individual enslaved laborers. Welcome, Hillary. Thank you. Dr. Sarah Bon Harper is the executive director at James Monroe's Highland. Her focus is on a multi-vocal history, which includes the perspectives and stories of the enslaved people who lived at Highland. Prior to her current position, she was the archeological research manager at Monticello. Welcome, Sarah. Thank Dr. You. Justine Hill Edwards will be our moderator tonight. She is an assistant professor of African American history at the University of Virginia, and her research focuses on the history of slavery in the United States. She had a book published this past spring by Columbia University Press entitled Unfree Markets, the Slaves Economy and the Rise of Capitalism in South Carolina. Welcome, Justine. Thank, Thank you, you for all for being here. Um, and I will um, let you start the conversation. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Good evening, everyone, on this very auspicious day, interestingly enough. We will get to talking a little bit about uh, this historical day in terms of Juneteenth. Uh, towards the end of our conversation, but I am excited to be here with you this evening, guiding our conversation about the lives and the experiences of enslaved laborers at these three dynamic historical institutions. So uh, Sarah, Hillary, and Gail, thank you so much for being here. And let's jump right in. And so why do you think it's important to highlight the lives of enslaved people at your historic locations? What is it about their experiences that you believe is important to highlight? Um, let's start with Gail. I'm happy to jump in on this topic. Thank you, Justine. It's not just at these three historical sites, it's at all historical sites, it's at all of America. Um, we don't need half history, we need all history. So when we talk about the lives of enslaved people at Monticello, for example, which I'm most familiar with, we're not just talking about the people who are enslaved there, we're talking about who they represent. And I like to say they represent the best of America. And all that 
those people who endured so much were able to survive. Not just the Hemings family or the Hubbard family from whom I'm also descended, not just the Gillettes, not just the Grangers, but people all across America who spent their lives serving others. In the case of Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson accomplished great things, also an ancestor of mine, but he would not have been able to do any of those wonderful things <laughs> if he had to think about how he was gonna feed himself, who was gonna provide that cold water, bucket of water he had that he put his feet in every morning or emptying his bedpan. He didn't have to do any of that. So those people, my family, enslaved in Monticello represent the millions who were enslaved. And the complete story has to be told through their narrative. It's essential, not only to understand Black American history, but American history, and to understand how we ended up where we are today, because we still live with the vestiges of enslavement every day, every one of us, white, black, yellow, brown, every one of us who lives in this country. Yeah, I think you're you're so right in terms of really understanding the full scope of American history. One cannot really do that. One cannot do, do that at all without really understanding the lives and the experiences of the enslaved and helping to construct what this nation came to be. Exactly, and our huge contributions to making this country successful. We need a whole story, not a half story. Good, thank you. Um, Hillary, what about you? How, how has um, your work at Montpelier uh, kind of helped visitors better understand the lives of enslaved laborers? Well, one of the things that I like to talk about, uh, particularly if I'm giving a tour, I usually finish my tour in view of the temple. And the temple is a classically inspired structure. And so it kind of represents those classical ideals of the founders and looking back to classical civilization for models of government. Mm -hmm. And yet the temple actually sits on an ice house. It was built by enslaved laborers. And I encourage people to think about it in a symbolic way that this temple is representative of the, the thoughts of our found and the works of our founding fathers was sitting on a foundation that was literally built through enslaved labor. And that in our history, we have these two important intersecting themes, the work of the founders, the legacies of slavery, and that coming to Montpelier, coming to other uh, plantations of the founding fathers really is an opportunity to think about how these themes intersect. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the case, of Montpelier to think about how we can commit ourselves always to forming a more perfect union. Wonderful. Hillary, I love um, the, the way that you talk about the kind of intersections, right? The intersections of um, the I ideas that the founders proposed in, um, and those I ideas really being put in, into place by the, the enslaved laborers. And so it's kind of the coming to, together of these lofty ideals with the actual work and labor of realizing those I ideals in real life. So great, thank you. And I think that's something that visitors sometimes struggle with because they think, well, if, I, if I'm appreciating the experience of the enslaved laborers, then I have to say, well, what the founders were doing was totally wrong. And I think that's where the idea of intersection comes in. We have to balance both these ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is a question that I hope we, we come back to, right? This very kind of binary understanding of visiting these historic locations and perhaps it's more complex than, than that. So thank you. Um, Sarah. Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, drawing on, on Hillary's remarks, I, we need to really understand how foundational slavery is to this country, whether it's our social systems, our economic systems, whether it's big corporations, banks, insurance companies, and so forth that exist today. Those Many of those profited from slavery and, and still exist in, in great wealth now um, as a result of that. Um, to really uh, to look back and say, you know, this is where a lot started was these systems of enslavement, of inequality, um, and to, to hear Gail say, you know, we're not through with it. We really need to understand um, how um, 
parts of um, a system from hundreds of years ago um, still exist around us. Um, you know, we talk some about um, the American colonization society and the movement to send uh, freed, uh, formerly enslaved Black Americans to Africa. And um, the idea really was that white Americans could not fathom a society in which whites and freed Blacks lived side by side. And um, we still live in that world today in many ways. Um, so really thinking about how these threads pull through, how they pull through um, the Jim Crow South, how they pull through the civil rights struggle and, and into today. And it's just, um, you know, it's really important to see where we've come from and what we're working towards. And I think the other um, piece that really we need to highlight is that um, the truths about slavery um, have traditionally not been told. Um, a lot of our work now um, is really focused on telling better and more truthful histories, but they have not been told for choices of former generations. Um, and also because the, of the, I call it the, the pre preciousness or the elusiveness of the details of individual enslaved lives in the documentary record. Um, we know that all history is fragmentary and especially the histories of enslavement and, and um, combing through to find the details um, takes perseverance and patience um, and is, is all that more important because those details are scarce. And so it's really important that we um, spend the time, like the work that Hillary does, for example, in pulling the biographical details out, the work that my colleague Nancy Stetz does with the Highland data, um, you know, pulling the details out of the written record um, because they're not abundant and they're not easy to find. So all the more important that we do it. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, and I, I love the fact that you talk about that long shadow of slavery, right? It's still here with us. If I can jump in for a minute, because I was really listening attentively, attentively to what Sarah was saying. And that it, it strikes me when she's talked about the preciousness, the preciousness, mm -hmm. the preciousness of the American myth. I, there was a film that said, you, you can't deal with the truth, I'm paraphrasing. I can't remember the name of the film, but you can't deal with the truth. Americans still don't want to face the truth of how this country was founded. Many Americans, I was reading over some material today thinking of this conversation in a poll, uh, 2019 poll taken by the Washington Post and a partner they used said that some 52% of Americans identified um, enslavement as the purpose of the Civil War. So I went back and I read over some documents of the Confederacy. I thought about what Alexander Stevens said. It's quite clear that the principal purpose of the Civil War was maintaining human beings as property. But Americans, many Americans still don't wanna face that. They still don't, they still agonize over the idea that their ancestors owned other people mm -hmm. and the cruelty of it and the abuse of it and the exploitation of it. And until we identify, you, you asked about um, why this is important, until we clearly identify and recognize that's what this country did to people and that the human beings are the people, the slaves are the enslaved or human beings, then we will not recognize as a country their descendants. And we see it every day. When a, when a kid who's got a toy gun is gunned down, we saw it last year when George Floyd was choked to death and it was recorded in front of people watching. That man's life was valueless to that cop, valueless. And that's an example that was caught on camera. Think of what's not. These are the legacies that we live with because people weren't seen as humans. So their descendants still aren't seen as humans. I get so passionate about this because it's my life. It's my son's life. It's the people I love and care about in their lives. Mm -hmm. And the, the legacy that, um, that you and your family 
importantly, kind of carry too as well. Um, and that legacy is important, but it's also a difficult one to contend with day in and day out. Um, I think you all are, have really brought um, some really interesting ideas to this conversation in terms of how to talk about slavery and the work that the, the three of you in particular have, have done at your respective institutions to bring that forward, to illuminate that. Um, and so that kind of gets to, to my second question. I, I, I'd love to hear you talk about how this focus on slavery has shifted over the past 10 or 15 years, right? If you visited Highland 20 years ago, um, what would the experience have been if you visited Monticello or Montpelier 10 or 15 years ago? How has that experience changed um, in terms of recognizing the lives and experiences of enslaved laborers? Whoever wants to jump in. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, change comes slowly. Um, and I think the thing I would really like to say is that every generation has to address history and, or address the past, let's say. And every generation has to ask its own questions. And these questions are products of our time and place, of our consciousness, of our experience. and um, we have evolved into thinking more inclusively about history where um, the focus on um, the white experience at these places used to be um, more exclusive. And now fortunately we have a, a greater understanding or work towards um, really fully weaving these histories together into what they are as one set of narratives, one set of stories that are parts of the same reality, the same whole. Um, you know, some of these sites, um, you know, have been working on really groundbreaking work for a long time um, and really have, have moved the needle on what, um, what histories are. And certainly, you know, I have, a, I have a long association with Monticello as well and was really um, fortunate to be a part of the great research teams there, um, really committed a long time ago, 25 and more years ago, to um, uncovering um, truths about our history, including slavery. Um, but you know, as as uh, research resources um, become available to these sites, um, I'm glad that we ask new questions and different questions than asking previously, and that's what changes. Wonderful. I came to Montpelier 11 years ago. And when I came here, I would say, we were, we were doing some interpretation of slavery. We had enslaved community walking tours. Uh, the Gilmore cabin, which is a freedman's cabin had been restored. Uh, we had held a couple of different uh, descendant reunions for descendants of the enslaved community. But one of the kind of pivotal moments for us, <clears throat> excuse me, was after the uh, restoration of Montpelier to the James Madison period, as opposed to the DuPont additions that had been made in 2008, a group of descendants were on a tour of Montpelier and they were looking out at the South Yard. And at that point, we had done some archeology span in the South Yard, which is where some of the dwellings for the enslaved were. And they had been outlined with uh, wooden beams and actually we were using weed killer on it just to keep the wooden beams from getting overgrown. And Iris Ford, one of the descendants said, you know, Madison gets a $10 million re restoration and all my people get are railroad ties and dead grass. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we really look back to now that pushed us forward in our thinking. And that was the beginnings of our planning for the uh, Near Distinction of Color exhibit that opened a couple of years ago. And for the research department in particular, uh, there was a, a pivotal moment during the planning process. And I can remember the uh, woman who was my supervisor at that time, who was directing the research project. Uh, she came back from a meeting that included some of the descendants and someone had said, you need to stop focusing on what you don't know and focus on what you do know. And now that just seems so obvious to us. But at the time we, we kept falling back on saying, well, 
you know, we just, there's just so much we don't know. We don't know who was related to whom. We don't know if Anthony that we see in this document is the 1780s, is the same person as Anthony that we see in the 1820s. And we would just get hung up on some of those things. But when we step back and really started thinking about what stories can we tell, mm -hmm. it really changed the way we approach things. And two examples I could give of that, one is in the mere distinction of color exhibit, we have an interactive map where you touch different spots on the map and you learn about an enslaved person who's associated with that place. But once you've touched that place on the map, there's a little dotted line that appears connecting back to Montpelier. So the more spots you touch, you start seeing this whole web of interconnectedness. So we can't always tell the whole story of an individual person but we can start to tell the story of a community. And uh, starting a year ago is the project that I've been working on a lot, the uh, naming project. And I'll, I'll put the website in the chat for everybody, anybody who wants to look at it. And this is really the reason, I'm the person who is writing the biographies now, but the research is really something we've compiled over many years and many different researchers have pulled documents and tagged them for different people's names. And what I'm doing now is really going through and looking at one person at a time to see what kind of arc of their life story can we tell. And in some cases, some people only show up in one or two documents. And so we can tell a story, but we have to talk about how limited that story is and why. And then there are other people, particularly people who lived past the Civil War, whose last names we know and that we can trace through the census and other documents, we can really tell a very full story of their lives, which I don't think we used to realize that we could tell that much. And if, if I could add to that, <clears throat> excuse me, please, I've got a little tickle in my throat. First, I'm really appreciative of the work being done at our sister museums. Um, I, I'm just in awe of the mere distinction of color. And I think it was a bold thing to do. And congratulations to you and um, Sarah. I, when we first met years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, I was always appreciative of your work and being honest, being honest about the history, including what house our um, president actually lived in there <laughs> at Met um, Island. Um, so the way I'm going to describe anecdotally the way things have changed at Monticello. When I first started visiting there almost 20 years ago now, the guy, guides would say, and I went on many tours often, and the guides would almost say as a toss away line uh, in a perfunctory or obligatory way, um, some historians believe that Thomas Jefferson had children with an enslaved woman, Sally Hemings. Now, then when this happened, at the time I didn't know my history, I, the history of my connection to the plantation, I knew that there was family lore we were connected to Thomas Jefferson and I wished myself into the Hemings family. So I would raise my hand and I would say, I'm a descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings and I was generally ignored. So fast forward oh, some, again, almost 20 years later and at Monticello, there's an exhibition called The Life of Sally Hemings. As part of that exhibition, there's a question asked, was it rape? It tells the story of the nuances that existed, not just in Monticello, but as part of enslavement. Um, it, it questions the primacy of Thomas Jefferson and of the founders. Um, and it elevates an enslaved woman to a position that, of honor, really, and a parody with Jefferson. And that is the goal, to raise the enslaved who populated that place. Members of the enslaved community always exceeded family members of the um, enslaved community were always, um, uh, there were always more there than there were of Jefferson's family, always. And their contributions were magnificent and monumental. And so that's how things have changed. Uh, an obligatory toss away line to an exhibition devoted to that woman. There's a kitchen there at Monticello now um, that focuses on 
Ursula Granger, who was an extraordinary cook. Not only was she an extraordinary cook, she took care of Jefferson's children and saved the life of his daughter, his sickly daughter, Martha Jefferson, um, who couldn't be cared for by her mother. Um, and Martha Jefferson was my four times great grandmother. So were it not for Ursula Granger, I wouldn't be talking with you today. Peter Hemmings, James Hemmings um, were part of that kitchen as well. We are raising the profile of the enslaved, raising them to the same heights as Thomas Jefferson, taking them to where they deserve to be. So again, my husband says, I repeat myself for emphasis. I do, I do, <laughs> admittedly. We have an obligatory toss away line, a, a guest who was essentially ignored for a long time to not only claiming that space at Monticello, but working at that space in Monticello and telling the story of the people who worked there among them, many of my family members and honoring them. I think that's huge. That's huge. Wonderful. I, I'm, I mean, it is so fascinating to see um, how the experiences of the the enslaved are really, Gail, you're, you're right, really kind of being risen up and illuminated in ways that we could not say that they, they were 15 or 20 years ago um, in a way that really helps visitors understand the challenges of enslaved life, but really the, the realities, right? The, the fact that yes, they were enslaved, they were chattel property, but they also attempted to forge their own way, right? They attempted to survive by any means necessary. And that was essentially a part of their experience as well. So um, um, so this kind of leads, leads me to my next question. Um, so what will visitors learn about slavery at um, Montpelier Highland and Monticello? Um, can you give us some tidbits about um, what we would learn if we were to visit um, in the next few weeks about the, the lives of enslaved men and women? So I'll just jump in if I may, um, and I'll, I'll be very brief. We'll learn that the enslaved were real people. They were real people with real families and aspirations. They were entrepreneurial. Um, the enslaved of Monticello sold eggs and vegetables to the Jefferson family. We learned that Elizabeth Hemings <clears throat> had her own cabin, that archaeologists have found around her cabin, fine china, which means that she raised the funds to buy fine things for herself. We'll learn that um, the enslaved had utilitarian objects such as toothbrushes. <laughs> I like to say to people, what's more humanizing than a toothbrush? We'll learn about family units, that they worked to hold their families together. And we'll learn in the case of Monticello that the descendants heard the words of freedom because the descendants of the enslaved community of Monticello produced people like William Monroe Trotter, who became a great activist and a civil rights activist and a, a real firebrand of his generation. He wasn't the only one. He's just the most prominent one. Um, there were descendants who were members of the Underground Railroad. There were descendants who were um, suffragettes. There were descendants who fought for civil rights and for social justice and for women's rights and for equal rights throughout their lives. There's a woman who's alive today named Peggy Priestley who's descended from that community. She's an activist. She's related to William Monroe Trotter. That's what they hear about. They'll hear about resistance and the strengths of the enslaved. They'll hear about the joys, not of enslavement, no, obviously, but a family. Again, humanizing. This is not gone with the wind, right? This is real. And people did what they needed to do to remain whole. That's why we're here today, because they had dignity and character and strength, which they passed on to us. And I mean that in a very broad sense, us as a unit. Thank you, Gail. Well, I can certainly talk about Highland um, and maybe in two parts.
parts. Um, our current initiative is uh, a month of public archaeology. Um, we have about a week and a half left. Um, our last day will be um, June 26th, which is a Saturday. We're out Tuesdays through Saturdays, um, weather permitting, um, doing archaeology and talking with people about Highlands history. Um, one area that we are excavating um, on the 1799 main house, and we call that the lost and found house, right? This is the president's former house that had been then destroyed by fire and completely forgotten about until we discovered um, its remains and announced a, a new understanding of the site in 2016, where the standing house is the presidential guest house from 1818. And then the, the actual main house is this really nicely preserved set of archaeological remains. And so we're out for a month um, excavating there, um, exploring um, different aspects of that house. But one area that we're uh, looking at right now is outside the kitchen, right? This house very interestingly had an attached kitchen. And we know that from the insurance documents that show a kitchen wing. Um, it was a two wing house. Um, one of the wings um, was the kitchen. Um, it's interesting that it was attached. At most houses we would expect at that time to have detached kitchens, um, which separated among other things. We hear all the practical reasons, fire and heat and so forth. We really also need to drill down on the separation of white and black living spaces and workspaces. The kitchen was no doubt the um, the workspace of an enslaved cook. Um, and the, for the first years, at least, of Highland, that enslaved cook was Hannah. And we know quite a bit about Hannah. We know her husband, Dick, and many of her children. Um, and we know that uh, she came to Highland and would have been enslaved there. And she, um, she also probably lived in the kitchen. She may have slept there at night, maybe with some of her children um, who were purchased with her. And we use those words really carefully, recognizing um, the brutality even of, of that concept of purchasing um, and enslaving a human being. But I, I've been thinking about Hannah a lot as we excavate there, um, trying to get closer to that workspace and that living space, um, trying to understand that experience and, and um, that, that proximity um, in the main house. So that's one piece. Um, our future work, we're um, in preparation for a new set of exhibits in the standing guest house, the one we correctly identified recently. And the new exhibits um, are going to provide the research-driven understanding of the site. It will be a self-guided visit through that, um, that building. And the um, exhibits really weave together the stories of um, the people and events of Highland. Um, we are fortunate in our small site to be able to reinterpret all at once um, and to talk about um, politics and economics um, together, Monroe in one breath and in the same breath, the lives of enslaved people. So if we talk about the Louisiana Purchase, for example, we talk about native people, we talk about um, enslaved people, we talk about then the, the big push for the, for the cotton growing south and the, and the hunger of the domestic slave trade um, for cotton producing areas um, and the, the impact that had um, even on the enslaved community at Highland, um, at first as a looming threat, um, a constant presence of the potential uh, of being separated from one's loved ones. Um, and then as a reality for a, a group of um, families sold to Florida um, by Monroe. So um, we're, we're putting those together. So yes, Monroe finalizing the deal in Paris, but then right to the lives of um, enslaved people who then were forcibly moved to Florida from Highland. So, so putting those together in one set of, of narratives about US history is really our goal for the new, um, the new exhibits. And I hope that people will begin to understand, as I was saying a little bit earlier, the sort of foundational role, the essential woven in role of slavery um, in, in the fabric of the United States.
At Montpelier, we have several different things going on, as, as Sarah was saying about Highland. Uh, this month, we are uh, co-sponsoring with the Orange County African-American Historical Society, a virtual Juneteenth celebration that is going on all month long. And I'm putting that website into the chat. So there are a lot of uh, interesting virtual things going on. But then this weekend, uh, we'll have some things open that haven't been open in a while during our pandemic uh, operating procedures. So the Mere Distinction of Color exhibit will be open uh, on Juneteenth. And pretty soon we will be uh, able to have that open on a more regular basis again. And we also have, as part of the Mere Distinction of Color exhibit, the buildings in the South Yard that you can uh, look into and get a sense of what it was like for the Stewart and Taylor and Jennings families uh, living there. And then because we have a uh, connection to James Madison and the Constitution, we also talk about constitutional issues of slavery and how slavery was baked into the Constitution. We talk about things like the Three-Fifths Compromise and the Fugitive Slave Clause. So we're, we talk some about the the broad picture of where slavery fit into the early American government, as well as what the experience was like for individual people at Montpelier. Oh, it's so fascinating to, to hear um, the, the three of you talk about how um, you and your colleagues have really be, literally excavated the, the lives of the being enslaved. I mean, from um, Gail talking about the intimate lives of enslaved men and women, right, to um, Sarah and Hillary kind of placing the lives of the, the enslaved within these broader historical events, such as the Louisiana Purchase and the Constitutional Convention and the cotton boom. And so, um, and so it sounds like visitors now can get a, a fairly comprehensive understanding of the kind of smaller but also larger ways in which um, the the enslaved lives kind of fit into this this period in American history in a really important way. So um, so kind of moving on and transitioning, um, can you tell us a little bit about perhaps some of the some of these more intimate moments, right? Um, Gail, you were really kind of bringing us into the lives of the enslaved families at, at Monticello. And I'm wondering if if the 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 three of you can kind of give us a bit more de detail about um, perhaps individual laborers that um, visitors might learn about when visiting um, Monticello, Highland, and Montpelier. So there Monticello, or Thomas Jefferson, owned some 600 people during his lifetime. Um, 400 of those people were gifted or sold or somehow separated. There are some two dozen surnames among those people. The folks we know the most about are the Hemings family, um, because in a different world, they would have been related to Thomas Jefferson. Um, as his late wife was the half-sister of Sally Hemings. So the Hemings family worked around the house. Uh, they were skilled laborers. The only people, a few more than a handful of people that Jefferson freed were his own children and other members of the Hemings family. But they're not the only family that um, served and um, the only family that was known intimately by, by Jefferson, there were others. Um, there was the Fawcett family. Now the Fawcetts were related to the Hemings family, but they were also skilled laborers at Monticello. Um, there were the Gillettes, there was the, the Granger family. The, the big George Granger was the only black overseer there at Monticello. Um, he was very skilled and highly respected. Um, there's the Hearn family. We know a lot more about those handful of families than we do those families that spent most of their time um, 
in the ground as Jefferson would have said, or in the field. Um, he didn't really know a lot of the people he enslaved. I mean, let's think of it. It's a, it's a community and there were hundreds of brown people there at any given time. Um, and it, there was a hierarchy and Jefferson was at the very top of that hierarchy. Remember he bought Mount Alto because no, no one was to look down on Thomas Jefferson, the small R Republican. Um, it's, you know, the man who lives like a prince. Um, but again, it's, these stories are very complicated and history is very complicated and nuanced. And I, I try not to judge my ancestor, but it does get difficult to do at times because he did write the Declaration of Independence, which spurred movements around the world while at the same time owning people. Um, so these enslaved people were skilled laborers. They were mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. And some 100 of them were sold several months after Jefferson died on July 4th in 1826. Um, I, I, feel, I feel these people with me all the time. I feel them when I speak of them. I feel that I know them. Um, it's, I'm deviating a little bit from the question, but it's always surprising to me when I hear people, specifically white people say, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know. Um, this is a generational thing. <laughs> Every generation there seems to be a group saying, I didn't know, I didn't know. How do you not know about enslavement? How do you not know about Jim Crow? People cannot say, I didn't know about George Floyd. We can't say this in anymore. We can't say we didn't know about what happened in Oklahoma anymore. We can't tolerate governors who are um, signing legislation that's banning teaching about race and, and, and gender inequities in um, public schools. We can't say we did not know and we can't tolerate this. Texas makes a huge determination on what, I'm speaking to you, Professor, you know this better than I, um, on what's taught in schools. And there are certain subjects that Texas won't, won't touch. Greg Abbott signed a bill, I think it was just yesterday, saying you can't talk about certain controversial, what he would call controversial aspects of race in the classroom. The education starts on these plantations. The truth begins on these plantations. The truth begins with these families. And it's people like us who have to raise the consciousness of people like the 50 plus participants listening who are on today, who are probably no doubt where we are. We're depending upon them to do the good work as well. It can't stop. It can't stop because people are still saying, I didn't know. Yeah, I love this idea of raising our consciousness. Yeah. yeah. You can't say that anymore. You can't say it now. It's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm going to talk anymore because I'm, <laughs> I'm getting, I mean, it's too late in the day to get this worked up, ladies. <laughs> it's always good to get this worked up on such an important topic. <laughs> um, Hillary or Sarah, what about you in terms of you know, these, these individual moments or experiences that you can share with us? One of the things that has struck me, particularly in the research we were doing for the mere distinction of color, was it really came home to me more the, the reality that there was always the chance of being separated from family, for enslaved families. And initially, I guess I was thinking of that more in in terms of someone might be sold as a punishment, and that did happen. But also just families could end up being split up due to situations that had nothing to do with them. So for example, James Madison Sr. typically gave land and slaves to his sons and daughters as they got married or as they were establishing their own, uh, own homes. And so for example, Eliza and her five children were among the slaves given to uh, Nellie Height, Nellie Madison Height when she got married. And she moved away to Bell Grove Plantation in the Shenandoah Valley. And so a moment 
the, for the Madison family was very happy of these two families coming together was really a moment in the enslaved community when families were pulled apart. And then in looking through uh, Isaac Height's commonplace book where he kept track of the enslaved, the people he enslaved and then uh, the children that they had and what he sometimes wrote down notes of what happened to them or he, the column was titled How Disposed. So in the sense of what did he end up doing with these people that he enslaved. And some, uh, a lot, one of Eliza's daughters and some of Eliza's grandchildren, Isaac Height ends up giving to his son, probably about the time that his son gets married. And so for Eliza, she had the experience of being pulled away from her family to go with the Heights to their home when they got married. But then she had the experience of losing a daughter and grandchildren who were sent to go with the Heights children. Yeah, I think uh, Hillary, your your in introduction of this I idea that what could what was perhaps a joyous day for one group could be so devastating for another, and I think that perfectly sums up um, the real uh, devastation of slavery for the the enslaved not having control over one's body, one's family, one's future. I think very much so. And I would like to um, bring up um, this idea of no choices. Um, and I am reflecting here discussion and commentary, Highland um, benefits from the, the council of a, of a very important group, which is um, descendants um, from Highland whose ancestors were enslaved at Highland. and. Um, one of the descendants in discussing what we would talk about tonight um, pointed out that really that's that's the difference between slavery and freedom is no choices. Mm -hmm. It is um, choices about one's own life, choices about um, staying with loved ones um, and, and living in that constant threat. So um, I think that's a really important piece to note. Um, I'd like to put two things um, in the chat here, um, if I can. Um, one, it, the first one is um, new work um, that we are doing. You know, Highland really, um, in, in so many ways, is in its infancy in the research world like this. Um, and through really good work by my colleagues and others, um, we have been compiling um, very short biographies from the documentary records um, of, of people enslaved at Highland and understanding their family relationships and um, their, their, where they came from and their eventual fates and maybe their roles, if we know that. So I've put the link into the um, highland.org enslaved biographies there. And I'm going to put a second one in um, now. Um, Two of the people that we know about um, are George and Phoebe. Um, and George and Phoebe um, self-emancipated. They ran away. They um, took their freedom um, and went. And we don't know what happened to George and Phoebe. We, in the link, um, if, if you click on it, you'll see there's an ad. Um, an ad is from uh, a newspaper at Special Collections at University of Virginia. Um, and it talks about their running away and, um, and have a look at it. Because if you sit with that for a few minutes and you think about um, that whole sort of moment, um, it really confronted with the idea of no choices. Um, and then that was a choice with, with um, often devastating consequences, um, but we kind of, we don't know, but we can hope um, that it's a successful day for freedom. Um, so learning about individuals like that um, with their individual stories um, is, is a really important thing. And, and um, I'll, I'll just do one more if you don't mind, um, because these, like I said, I'm gonna loop back, these details are precious. Right for generations, we did not know or recognize, um, and for 
generations, we did not tell these stories. So, you know, a, a few years ago, we announced major research discoveries of um, the new house, um, the, the house that we found, the Lost and Found Main House, and, and we re-identified correctly, identified the standing house as um, the presidential guest house. Um, Monroe um, ordered it built during his first full year as president. Um, and in the documentary records, you know, the, the existence of this house was flitting in the edges of the documentary records. And if you kind of looked really hard, you could see the shadow of something missing there. And so we followed that. And that's how we got to the discovery that we did. But in the letter that Monroe wrote to his son-in-law, George Hay, on September 6th, 1818, he's writing from Highland. And he talks about um, building a new house just below the present one for lodgers. And um, he talks about the house being built by an enslaved carpenter, a man he bought from Judge Brook last winter for $450 in George. And through the careful and detailed work of my colleague, Nancy Stetz, we are able to say that the carpenter bought of Judge Brook last winter is Peter Mallory. Mm -hmm. And the George among the several, a different one that ran with feet, um, is George Williams. And we know both of these men's wife, wives' names. Um, mm -hmm. We know that they were usually at Oak Hill in Loudoun County. They must have come for this, this project and so forth. And so instead of thinking about um, you know, just a building on a landscape, we think about the house that Peter and George mm -hmm. we, we we think about what that must have been like. Um, and in fact, in our augmented reality tour that we ran for several years, um, we had a scene like that where the enslaved cook, Hannah, that I've also talked about, spoke with a spinner and talking about what it must have been like for Peter and George to be separated from their wives who were still at Oak Hill, Loudoun County, um, which now would take us a couple hours to get there, then it would be much, much longer. Right, and so to think about that experience, to bring, bring back the multivocality, to understand the actual experience of these individuals um, built by these two men whose names and families we know, and then to think further about what that experience must have been like, separated from their loved ones, in this case, temporarily. But of course, we know in so many cases the, the separations were permanent. It Thank you for that, Sarah. If I could just jump in for a minute. Um, I, I sit on a few descendant boards and I'm really thrilled about what's happening with the descendant communities. Um, and it, it feels like a movement actually among descendants. And, and in many ways it was initiated with Monticello's Getting Word Oral History Project, which is almost 30 years old now. Um, where, where Cinder Stanton and her colleagues, the Saint Cinder Stanton and um, Diane Swan Wright and Beverly Gray collected stories of from descendants, traveled thousands of miles collecting um, descendant stories. And this has grown. I, uh, there's something, I think a big deal happened at Montpelier yesterday that I, I, others should discuss rather than I. They know much more about it than I do. But it's, it's just so impressive that this movement is happening, that these stories are being told, that, um, that we are embracing our history, that we are not, that there was, let me back up a little bit. Within the black community for a long time, there was shame associated with enslavement. Um, people of a certain generation didn't wanna talk about slavery. They wanted to assimilate, they wanted to move forward. Well, all that's changing now. It's not that people don't want to move forward, but people want to identify and acknowledge what happened in the past mm -hmm. and acknowledge the pain that people had to endure to get where we are today. And that pain will help us, acknowledging that pain will help us make change. And that's why this descendant movement is so essential and it's just rising. I believe will make a difference in how we engage with each other as Americans. Descendants have a great opportunity through their own personal experience to, to share and to help Americans grow as a single country. Um, I, I, I'm thinking about what you said about the, the couple that ran away are escaped, they escaped. Um, 
there are a couple of members of, of the Hubbard family, my ancestors, who escaped or attempted to. Um, one of them was brought back in chains, Jefferson Ann and Lipped. Um, his, his name was um, James Hubbard. His derivative diminutive was Jamie Hubbard. Um, it, it's remarkable that we know these stories of, of people who just wanted to live free. They just wanted to live free. And so we're embracing these stories now, we descendants and our allies. And um, it's, uh, I'm proud to be part of the movement, to be with all of you moving this forward. I'm gonna put this um, getting word in the chat as well for people who are familiar with it. Wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple minutes left and then we will uh, take some questions from our audience. But um, considering that, that uh, today, um, President uh, Biden signed a bill that would make Juneteenth a federal holiday. Um, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what this means for perhaps the ways in which you think about your own work at um, Montpelier, Highland, and Monticello, and perhaps um, how this might, how this question of Juneteenth might um, might become a part of just the experience of visiting these locations. We're very excited to see Juneteenth become a holiday because. For us, it has been one for quite a while. Uh, the Orange County, Af Orange County African American Historical Society started celebrating uh, Juneteenth a number of years ago. And then for the past five or six years, it's, it's either been at Montpelier or last year and this year, it's a somewhat virtual version, but it's wonderful to see the acknowledgement of the importance of Juneteenth and hopefully during the conversation to get people talking more about I me mean, for having a national holiday that talks about the end of enslavement it kind of kind of push us to talk about the rest of enslavement <laughs> and we need to talk about that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wonderful i think bringing it to the the national level is a really big move um yeah, let's let's enter into the conversation. Let's enter fully. Let's be thoughtful, um, and let's talk about um, you know how long after the enactment of the Emancipation Proclamation um, Juneteenth actually occurred. Mm -hmm. um, two and a half years, mm -hmm. and um, what that meant. Um, let's talk about how far we've come but let's talk about our commitment to how far we have to go um, and to getting to a, a better place in our dialogue and in our actions. Wonderful. And I would recommend um, going on to Monticello's website, monticello.org, um, to look at a recording that was made yesterday with Annette Gordon-Reed who's written a book called Juneteenth, which is a memoir, but she's from Texas and she's um, a scholar and um, she's also on our board. And she's written about the history of Juneteenth. And there's also a nice list of books that you can find online at um, bu.edu. I guess that's Boston University maybe, but .bedu. That's recommending several books for adults and teens to read about Juneteenth. Um, and if you, when you go on to monticello.org, you can also learn some of, the, some of the other activities we have going on involving um, civic engagement and conversations involving civics in the United States of America. Wonderful. Well, um, Sarah, Hillary, and Gail, thank you so much for your insight and your comments and really your passion about uh, really bringing the experiences of enslaved laborers to us, to visitors who are looking to gain a fuller understanding of the lives of the people who lived and worked at these historic locations. So thank you. Um, so now we have about 30 minutes for a Q&A. Um, let's see. So if you have any questions, 
uh, feel free to put them in the Q and A, and then Ann and I can work together too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to Justine, I have one. I have one right now, um, and I think it 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 follows a little on what um, Gail was mentioning, but what you all touched upon was um, how do we go? And this might be a really impossible question to answer, but um, how do we go about raising the consciousness um, of people who are that so i i think we have to overcome any discomfort we have about talking about the subject and about talking about people who don't look the same or act the same or have the same um, um opinions that we have and, and and frankly i think it's really incumbent upon white people to have these conversations i think that black allies and brown al allies among whites really need to go talk to white people who don't don't get don't get it just don't get it mm -hmm. um I, I i think the burden should not be on people who have been oppressed and who continue to be oppressed and who are not haven't been heard we've been talking this saying these things and preaching this for prior to 150 years, prior to emancipation, and we're still not being heard. So we need whites and we need white allies to speak to people and help them understand why these inequalities exist, why um, a, a college-educated Black family, generations of college-educated Black family still has less equity and wealth than a white family with a high school education. Why does that exist? So I think that would be a start. Sarah and Hillary, did you? Yeah, I just want to say, I feel like in a lot of ways, um, you know, we're fortunate to be doing the work we're doing at Highland right now. You know, there's been a lot that hasn't been done previously at Highland. And so we now have the opportunity to really change the narrative, to bring conversations and to do so with today's sensibilities. And another fortunate thing is that we often have the time and space with our visitors to have small group conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations, extended dialogue, to really think together and to encourage people to step a little further, um, move out of their comfort comfort zone and to think um, more about what um, slavery was like, what of enslaved people in Highland were like, um, how um, slavery fit into our nation's story. So having those conversations um, just with people um, mm -hmm. is the way we make change. Um, and to have patience with one another, to um, approach it the way you would stepping into a classroom, yeah. right? Yeah. You want to find out what your um, students, your interlocutors in whatever form are, are already thinking, mm -hmm. and you want to reach them there and bring them forward. Yeah. Um, and our, our guests at Highland, you know, come with a variety of opinions and, and backgrounds, and we try to... Um, you know, share what we know in a way that will invite them to think more, think harder. And I like Gail's comment of stepping, um, putting putting aside our discomfort and getting going through it. Um, it our our nation's history um, is difficult in a lot of ways. Um, our nation's present is difficult, yeah. and just having patience with one another, having compassion for someone who thinks differently from how we think or how I think. Um, I think, you know, that's not a bad idea in life in general. Um, and certainly in teaching um, is important. And um, I think that these public history sites are really about teaching, about encouraging people to explore. And I think persistence is an important mm -hmm. part of the equation because our visitors on site and the people who interact with us on social media, what they come for at Montpelier is not always the story of the enslaved community, but when they find us, 
they will find stories about Madison and Dolly Madison and the constitution, all those things they were looking for, but we make it pretty inescapable for them. Uh, they have to encounter slavery in some way. And so many people, I think, are open to learning more. Mm -hmm. Some people are not. And certainly we see that on social media a lot that we as Americans have gotten into two very different camps and we really can't hear what each other is saying because we're busy reacting to what we think the other side is saying, which is, is something you can work on in couples counseling. And I do think America right now all needs to be in couples counseling. Yeah. Thank you. That's Uh, well, I have another question here. Do you think the stereotypes presented in the media, especially movies, have somehow hidden the truth? I know, Gail, you mentioned Gone with the Wind, which was, um, and what role does do, do movies, for instance, play in, in not understanding this history or not acknowledging this history? Or even popular culture in general. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. So the, the most racist movie ever made in America was Birth of a Nation. Oh, yeah. Um, and Birth of a Nation resurrected, I mean, it literally resurrected the Klan. Um, Woodrow Wilson, one of the most racist presidents in the United States of America, for whom my maternal grandfather worked, incidentally, um, had a viewing of Birth of a Nation in the White House. And it didn't start there. Stereotypes didn't start there. Um, um, uh, you just said in popular culture, Justine, we've had these images. I remember, I grew up in Washington, DC. I remember going to school in DC and learning about reconstruction. And this is in the 60s and 70s. And here's how reconstruction was demonstrated to me, a textbook with um, a, an oversized, an illustration of an oversized black man with his feet up on a desk, uh, I suppose it was supposed to be in Congress smoking a great big fat cigar. Mm -hmm. So this is what, I'm a little girl at this point, this is what reconstruction and this is what my people, I didn't even know they were my people at the time, but you can read about that in my book. Um, were like, you know, they, they didn't understand the rules. <laughs> they didn't understand Robert's rules of engagement. They didn't know how to behave. They were uncivilized. This is what emerged out of Jim Crow. And so, and, and we, still, we still see some of that. Not some of it, we see a lot of it. I, I mean, when I was a reporter, I remember arguing with my news director down in Savannah, Georgia, about how a suspect is identified, don't say a black male, that covers half the population. <laughs> you know, give us a full description, how tall is he, what was he wearing? When you have a white suspect, you get a whole description of who that person was. It's very narrow, you get a black person, you know, you're, you're tracking down every, every black man in the city. Mm -hmm. So it just, it, it goes on, it goes on, it goes on. So yes, there's a stereotype that's still part of the popular culture, I think. And I'd like to say that, um, I think I have no business talking about popular culture, but I, I, um, I'm famously um, with my nose in a book and not in popular culture. But um, I, I think I wanna say, that, you know, stereotypes in general, that's one of those things that um, prevents us from seeing each other. And when you're talking about that compassion and that reaching out to one another to change ideas or to share ideas, um, you know, stereotypes are one of those things that get in the way. Mm -hmm. So if we are willing to, you know, think past these camps that Hillary describes and see each other as individuals and not um, predispose ourselves to thinking we know what the other one intends, um, I think we'd all be better. Right. But perhaps it is a question about um, just how popular culture, how um, TV and film has portrayed the history of slavery. Yeah. 
um, that is uh, so pervasive and just so influences how we talk about the enslaved. I mean, there is an entire push, and I consider my, myself part of it on the part of historians, um, to kind of move away from just saying slave, right? We're talking about people who were enslaved. Their enslaved status did not completely define them. They were men, women, wives, husbands, sisters. They were traders and chefs and gardeners, right? And so really kind of illuminating the, um, for lack of a better term, humanity of the in enslaved person, I think is, is part of this, this as well. But, um, but there, there has been this, um, this really pervasive kind of strain of thought about how slavery is portrayed that perhaps in influences why it's taken perhaps so long <laughs> for the experiences of the, the enslaved to come front and in, in center in our historical sites. I think that's right. I had to reprogram as an adult the way I saw enslavement and the way I saw myself reflected on the screen. Look, I liked Gone with the Wind. <laughs> I didn't understand. I, I mean, to me, it was a romance and it was this, it was beautifully shot. It was the cinematography was amazing. I didn't understand the damage that film was doing to people. I didn't understand that was the um, um, the lost cause story. I didn't. I didn't get it. All I understood is that my mom, who was born in 1918, um, said Clark Gable said at the end of the film, "Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn." <laughs> That's what resonated with her and with me. And. Vivian Lee as Scarlett O'Hara. I mean, I, I, I romanticized, I romanticized this horrible racist film. The stuff is damaging. Look what it's done to us. They had black people there acting like they didn't have a brain in their head. Most people wouldn't have been able to, to survive if they were as servile as they, they were presented in that film, Gone with the Wind. I mean, but. It's real. I, I see in, in, in the chat, somebody says it's Holly, Hollywood teaches. It does. That's why it's so damaging. It does. It teaches. People believe that stuff. Educated people believe it. I had to, as I said, I had to reprogram. I had to go back and rewind the whole doggone thing. I've watched it several times <laughs> just to <laughs> get it out of my system to say, no, this is not, this is not right. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, so we have a few more questions here and we, we, we still have time, which is great. Um, so somebody has asked, I would like to know more about Ms. White Hemings, Ms. White's Hemings Jefferson ancestry and when her book will be available. She speaks so beautifully about them all. Well, thank you so much. I, I love that question. Thank you for asking that. So I happen to have here on my table, uh, uh, a galley copy. The book, won't, this is the galley copy. This is what it looks like, if you can see it. The book will not be ready until, um, not won't be released until November 16th. And um, it's described as a true story of race, class, and redemption. It's about my 50-year um, search to find my family through an oral history connecting me to Jefferson, as I mentioned earlier, and what that 50-year search has brought me. And what it has brought me um, and, and how I hope it will inspire other people is peace and purpose and an embrace of my family and my family's history and who we are as Black people and how powerful we are. It has given me, finding my family has given me, um, I already had a pretty good id, but it's, it's given me the strength I needed I need to have to speak to you as openly and, uh, and as honestly as I am right now. And to encourage other people to find their passion and their strength in their roots and to find comfort. I, I grew up not dealing with race or talking about race and I grew up comfortably in Washington, DC. But here I am late in life talking about discomfort, things that would have made me uncomfortable a few years ago. 
and it's in, it's in the book. So it's called Reclamation, Sally Hemings, Thomas Jefferson, A Descendant's Search for a Family's Lasting Legacy. And it's about the dignity and strength of a family. Thank and you, Gail. Hopefully we'll, we will get um, that book at our library too. So we'll have lots of copies that people can check out. And um, Thank you, I appreciate thank it. Thank you for asking. There's another question someone asked, I'm planning to visit all three sites next month. Any suggestions about getting the most out of a visit when looking for the lives of the enslaved people? I'll say start on, the sorry, dog barking. <laughs> Zooming from home, everybody's there. Um, I'd say start on the websites. Um, all three websites have resources um, and you know, get that context first and, um, you know, really, really look and, and see, see there first. At least that's, I would say, just from a Highland centric standpoint, but that's my suggestion. Thanks, Sarah. That's good. I would yeah. also say start with our website for Montpelier, particularly in this coming out of COVID period things are changing rapidly as far as what we're able to offer and we're gradually expanding things so uh, if you wait a little bit longer hopefully we will have mere distinction of color exhibit open on a more regular basis and that i would really like for you to be able to see that excellent and i would say the same thing and what's happening at monticello is open of course and what we're doing is we have a hybrid now where you can take a virtual tour and um, um, what, what do you call it when they download? I'm sorry, it's late for me. I'm trying to think of what, at any rate, you can go on, go on to monticello.org and take a virtual tour and get the um, lots of lessons in advance of your visit, um, lots of insight from guest appearances and um, streaming, that's the word I'm looking for. There's lots of streaming, lots of streaming that you can, um, get when you visit monticello.org to learn in advance what the experience would be like firsthand when you visit. So it's a great place to start. I agree with what everyone said, go online. Thank you. Let's see, we have another question. Um, somebody's asking, um, how do you think future historians 30 years from now will feel and think when they look back on the work that's being done by historians today? And, and how do you hope or want them to think and feel? I think about that a lot. That's and I think about, um, are we pushing hard enough? Are we being inclusive in all the places we need to be inclusive? Are we including multiple perspectives? Um, you know, I think we talk a lot about, um, and I'm speaking more than just our sites in sort of public history, say Virginia um, tourism, um, Virginia National Register, all of the um, ways that we, we talk about history. Um, and I think it's really important to consider um, sites that are specifically African-American. And, and I think it's also really, really important to um, include acknowledgements um, and inquiries of race in all the places so that there should not be a mainstream history and black history. Yes, yeah because this really, really is, um, race is so central to um, life in Virginia centuries that I think there, there cannot be um, history without some acknowledgement. And I, I push myself and I push my colleagues to really think about that. Um, and I think about looking back, you know, we, we look back now at what they were doing maybe in the 1950s and um, but I don't want people to look back at what we, you know, in a way, I, I hope they do in some ways, because that means they're way far ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I want that growth, but I also want them, I want us to measure up to, to mm -hmm. what we should be doing. And I really push us to not have white history mm -hmm. or mainstream history and black history. I want us to, have, yes, we should definitely lift up places, um, all of the history that we need to, and we need to include it in all of the history we do so that it's, there's no, there's no 
history of Virginia without talking about race, really. That's, that's a good answer. Thank you, Sarah. That's a good. I hope that the historians looking back on our work 30 years from now will say, <clears throat> why did you people think this was so hard? This has become normal now. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, I hope, um, <laughs> I hope people years from now aren't looking back and saying, I didn't know. That's what I hope above all. I hope we're not going through this once again and another generation saying, I didn't know. Yeah, well, I, 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 think, uh, I have one more question, but I, I, to respond to that, Gail, I just want to say thank you to all of you for helping people know. So that's, that's the beginning. Um, so here, here's probably the last question we can take this evening. Um, given the news out of Montpelier, the board formally voted on Wednesday to enter into a co-stewardship with descendants of the enslaved communities, what is the future for these historic sites and sharing authority with descendants of the enslaved? Hi, Naya. <laughs> um, thank you for that question. And we are really, ex we're really excited. Um, we'll be have you'll be seeing more press releases coming out. Um, and I'm, I may not be the best person to talk about the technicalities of the ways in which the bylaws change. But the key idea is that the Montpelier board has embraced the idea of parity, so that members of the Senate community will have the opportunity to nominate people to serve on the Montpelier board and to up to the point where we have basically half of the uh, members of the board have been selected by members of the Senate community. And I think it's really exciting that um, that we've taken a pretty bold step, I think. And it will ensure that, that these ideas of interpreting enslavement and interpreting these themes do become the new normal. It's not something that one or two people on the board can speak up and say, this ought to be happening. It will be really integral to the board as a whole. And I think it's, it's really exciting going forward. We don't know exactly how that's going to play out. I would imagine, uh, if nothing else, uh, renewed emphasis on interpreting enslavement and African-American life, new uh, avenues of research to be pursued. Um, it's very exciting. Well, you know, um, I spoke earlier of a descendant movement and I, I know a lot of the descendants um, who were part of yesterday's activity. Um, They're at the forefront of this movement and um, I am in awe of them and they are leading the way. Thank you very much to the Frenches and the others who were at the forefront and are at the forefront of this. It's pretty doggone remarkable. And so good for you guys. I want to say too that you know Montpelier has led um, this in a lot of ways and one of the things really was in um, February of 2018 Montpelier along with the National Trust um, led a symposium on how to um, uh, teach and learn about um, slavery and especially descendant engagement um, and those of us who attended um, that several day symposium also um, contributed to the construction of a rubric, we call it the rubric, um, about descendant engagement. Of course, one of the, and, and that real sharing authority in that, that we um, from outside the community do not have um, the right to and have sole authority for teaching that history. So. Um, really that that properly belongs to the descendants of those who were so uh, so deeply impacted by the events of slavery. So, um, you know, Montpelier was there. Um, and so I've put the the summit material in the chat uh, or in the yeah, in the chat and Hillary's put directly the rubric. Um, so you get both those pieces there. Um, but really, you know, this is 
being on the board, that's what it's really it's on the rubric in the in the far right column, and that's what we should be doing. Um, who who owns the past, really? Yeah. I feel like this conversation is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, but I, I want to thank all of you for your um, amazing contributions to this really important topic. Um, I also want to say it, um, that we at the library also has resources. Um, we have some um, great books about this history. And um, so feel free to give the library a call or go on jmrl.org and look on the catalog. And um, we have a lot of books now um, about Juneteenth. And um, so that's another resource. And um, I, again, I want to thank you all. Dr. Edwards, did you have anything else you wanted to add or? I would just say that I am in awe of the, the work that the, the three of you do. And um, I look forward to continuing to see the wonderful ways in which you bring the lives and experiences of the enslaved to the world and how we understand um, these three historic locations. So thank you all for your, for your hard work and dedication. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Juneteenth, Juneteenth, everyone. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. Thanks to all of you. Many, many thanks. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.